I've just bought myself a DMX buffer repeater and isolator and this unit is an extremely useful device in the lighting industry and I'll show you why. <coughs> in the lighting and entertainment industry we use a, a data protocol if that's a lighting desk there we use a data protocol called DMX512 DMX512 and that's purely to do with the data the format of the data and it's transmitted using an electrical standard, very standard electrical standard, RS485 electrical standard. And basically it means that you can get 512 channels of dimming or control along one single thin twisted pair cable. So the cable comes out and it loops through everything that it's controlling. And if it's just a short run of light and it's just one sort of roughly maybe a straight line of lights, then it's, it's easy. The cable just runs along them all. However, if you uh, exceed a certain number of lights, and in the case of the RS485 protocol, the maximum you should have is 32 on a run. And that, you know, each light represents one unit load. And in some cases, some non-compliant lights can actually draw more current than the standard one and that actually reduces the number you can drive and in other uh, applications of modern lights you can actually get some with fairly high high impedance inputs on their receivers and they can actually allow you to run more but uh, it's better without actually knowing um, what's actually in your lights to say 32 maximum and then stick a buffer before the next 32 so that's one application, is to buffer the signal up and strengthen it, uh, base, basically put it back up to the full strength signal again uh, for continuation along more lights. That's also useful if you have a really huge long run of cable because the length of the cable can cause gradual degradation of the signal and uh, you can add it as a buffer to actually boost the signal up again. If you want to go off in multiple directions with cables, you can't just tee off from the data cable. It might work, particularly in short runs, but it's not actually compliant with the standard. So in that case, you use a buffer and the buffer splits it out amongst separate outputs. So you'd have one input um, and that one input could actually be looped right through to these other ones, or you could just take it straight into the unit and just buffer it and have three fresh outputs. The next use is for zone isolation. If you have a lighting rig up that's set, you know, it's got multiple areas it actually runs through and they run off separate generators or power supplies, you can end up with significant ground differentials. And sometimes it's better and it's certainly safer to put an opto-isolated buffer in, which this is, it turns out, which is good, um, to actually electrically isolate these two sections. Uh, so that's uh, most of the uses. Uh, not all of the uses, it's, uh, but it covers most of the applications. Now, on the subject of RS-485, it's quite interesting in that the RS-485 protocol has three wires in the electrical protocol, which are basically called A, B, and it's the screen cable, which is also the common, common ground reference. And to allow it to transmit data, even though it's only about 5 volts, plus or minus 5 volts, typically on something like this will certainly push out plus or minus 5 volts, um, to transmit it the huge distance it, distances it can at very high speed. Um, if it's wanting to transmit, say, a, a logic 1 of the data, the A will go positive and the B will go negative, and if it wants to transmit a logic 0, um, the A will go negative and the B will go positive, and it's that switching backwards and forwards, it's that actual uh, alternating polarity basically allows it to really push electrical transitions down that line and uh, provide fast data rates. It's also because it's a differential uh, protocol, um, the, if there's any electrical interference induced onto the cable through running past high power cables that induce current on, because it's inducing it onto both the A and B simultaneously as it passes, because the receiver chip only looks for the polarity difference between those two pins within within a modest range from the, the screen level, um, it can reject common mode interference. So um, it's, it's a very good robust standard. 
Now, this device wasn't the most expensive. Normally, if you go for the professional ones, they cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And this one uh, I bought from a disco supplier for £80. And part of the reason I bought it was it's a Showtech DB-1-4. And part of the reason I bought it was because I wanted to see what was inside it. It was just technical interest. Because a proper um, buffer and splitter should actually take the input, uh, use a proper DMX uh, RS-485 receiver chip to decode that input, um, and then it should use an optwise slater to drive the outputs, which should also be RS-485 transmitters. And I was surprised when I opened this to find that, uh, first of all, I was expecting it just to have one circuit board, like so many of the cheap things do, along the front here, but it's not. It's got a separate board, uh, and then sub-boards. And it surprised me because it's actually a really good design. It really is well made, surprisingly well made. The first thing that struck me when I opened this was that, um, well, the, the first thing I noticed was the circuit board up at this end with all the cables and the fact that the, the connectors have all been tacked in place with this gunky sealant to actually stop them coming apart, which is pretty good. The second thing I noticed was the two transformers. Now, the reason the two transformers is that it technically is two separate supplies it's using. One for the receiving circuitry, then the opto-isolator, and then another transformer for the output circuitry, so it really is proper isolation. Some cheaper units try to cheat. They might use an opto-isolator, just driven directly from the data line, which is not standard. It's not a reliable way of doing things. And then just one transformer um, feeding all the outputs, driving all the outputs. Other um, cheap cop-outs use a transformer that has two secondary windings, and one secondary winding feeds the input um, receiving circuitry, and then the other secondary um, feeds the outputs. And again, that's not 100% ideal because both those um, windings are wound on the same bobbin as such on the same side, and there's not the proper full mains isolation that it should have. In this case, though, it is completely full mains isolated between these two supplies. So, looking at the circuitry in here, um, oh, I should actually point out, the unit has tons of connectors along the front. It's actually uh, <coughs> one input and four outputs, but it's actually got eight connectors and outputs, and it's got four connectors and input. The reason for this is that there are pairs of plugs and pairs of sockets. There are five pin XLRs and there are three pin XLRs. The reason for that is that the DMX standard uh, specifies a five pin connector. Uh, technically speaking, in most applications, only three pins are used on that connector. So the disco industry, in its ever increasing bids to save money, used a standard cheap three pin XLR cable because it's a lot cheaper and more readily available. And this also encourages people to use microphone cables, which is not ideal because microphone cable is not data cable. But they use it and sometimes they get off with it and sometimes they don't. So to allow for the fact that some cables are 5-pin, some are 3-pin, it just gives you the option. So these are common. These are common and these, you know, it's just done in pairs. So you've got the option. But you can't use more than one of these outputs. Um, if you did run two cables out of these, if you ran a 3-pin one to 5-pin one, you'd effectively be splitting without active buffering on those two cables. It would be in, it would breach this sort of standard, um, uh, and you shouldn't really do that. It might work for some applications, but you, you always run the risk of signal reflections. And the importance of uh, avoiding these signal in reflections and interference is that... Uh, when you get interference on a, the DMX standard, uh, is not it doesn't have any error correction in it. So when you get electrical uh, reflections interference, it can actually corrupt the data. And when that happens, lights and smoke machines will just say, oh, that's the data we're supposed to receive, and they'll just do what they're told. And it can result in lights flickering and flashing, dimmers pulsating and modulating up and down, smoke machines running without any desire to have them running. And uh, in the case of the moving headlights, they might suddenly go berserk. They might start going to random positions and strobing or change, chasing colour or their gobos, the images they're projecting will just start spinning. And that's not desirable at all. So 
It's got the two inputs, but they're common, and then it's got what's called a loop through, uh, the, what they call in here the DMX link. And all that means is that if you want to just slot this into an existing um, run of lights, you can just loop it in and out again, and it will just pretend it's basically, it will be equivalent of just having an extra light in the line. And that means then you'll, after, although you have uh, still using that whole line of uh, items, you've still now got completely four completely free uh, outputs. This also, if you just have this on its own, also lets you plug in a terminator. Now, a DMX terminator is basically a plug with a 100 or 120 ohm resistor tacked across pins 2 and 3. And what that does, and this is where it gets horribly complicated, is it... Uh, it matches the characteristic impedance of the cable and electrically it makes the cable look as though it's infinitely long and you won't get reflections along it. Without it there is a risk that you'll get um, electrical sort of reflections coming back along the cable and you can get sort of almost like standing waves in the cable that cause corruption of data at very precise points along it. It's very odd, very, very annoying at times. So we've got uh, all the plugs and sockets here, and the receiver uh, unit in here, the, the circuit board in here, has the two power supplies come in. It's got a PTC thermistor for protection, it's basically an electronic self-resetting fuse on each of the power supplies, a bridge rectifier, then I don't know if these electrolytic capacitors are directly in parallel, or I see a ferrite bead down here. It might be there's an electrolytic capacitor, ferrite bead, and then another one, which is probably the case. And that's purely for filtering reasons, noise filtering, which is very good. It's got two 7805 regulators, and basically speaking, these this pair of power supplies is just generating a 5-volt supply for the output circuitry and a 5-volt supply for the input circuitry. The input circuitry, uh, which has linked with the cable all the way along to the input uh, sockets, has a SN75176BP chip. That's a very common RS485 receiver or transmitter chip that can be configured as a receiver or transmitter. In this case, it will just be a receiver. And interestingly, along with all the others here, I noticed there's a couple of links as though there's some other component could have gone in there um, and two suppression diodes to protect the data lines. I'm not sure what the components that are missing from here are, they're labelled MZ6 or MZ6, which uh, I'm not sure that is. I don't know if it's some sort of maybe a, a, a small low current electronic fuse just to actually protect the, the data lines, I'm not 100% sure. So the data comes in from the uh, input sockets gets buff gets decoded by this chip, well, it just gets converted into a logic level, uh, and that then drives this opto-isolator. The opto-isolator is a 6N137, and it separates, you can see there's a distinct track uh, that goes right underneath the opto-isolator and then between those two power supplies, and it's the bit that couples um, the input to the outputs, and it provides optical isolation. This buffers up, this provides a, basically a logic output, but what they call an open collector logic output, so that it needs a resistor to actually pull it, uh, I'm not sure if it's pulling it up, it's an open collector, so it'll be pulling it a pull-up resistor, and I think that's what this is here, and then that output then feeds all the uh, output chips, which are also the SN75176BP chips, but they're configured this time as output drivers. They're, they, they're actually driving the output sockets in the front with the uh, <coughs> two-wire uh, two, uh, data. There are also, and it took me a moment to work out these were, were for, there are also two LM358N, which are dual op-amps, and I just, initially I was thinking, what on earth have they added them for? And then I was looking at the front and I suddenly realised it's for the LEDs. It's basically buffering the output, it's providing uh, just a signal to the LEDs and showing that the outputs are changing state and that will then drive the LEDs to show that there's data on each output and each one is being individually monitored by a separate op-amp to show that these LEDs will actually indicate what's happening on this socket. If they, they stop 
flashing or they go out, um, then that probably means there's a problem, If particularly if you've got uh, data shown on all the other ones and then this pair at the end, their LEDs just either stuck on or went off, it would indicate that maybe the chip had failed. And talk about chips failing, they're not in sockets. Now, they've possibly done that uh, for reliability because chips can gradually work their way out of sockets thermally. I'm not sure, but um, I prefer things in sockets, but maybe it is just for reliability, in the same way that these are kind of glued in so they can't come out. And fundamentally, that's it. It is a fully, it's got the input fully opto-isolated, and then it rebuffers it as four separate outputs at RS-485 levels. And I suppose that this doesn't just have to be limited to DMX. If you've got an RS-485 network uh, running uh, just a unidirectional one, just transmitting in one direction at a fairly low frequency, 250 kilohertz or so, then you could probably use this to buffer that as well. Oh, this uh, channel here is because there's an M10 uh, threaded insert here. And this is behind that. It's because this is designed to mount on lighting rigs and you can put a hook clamp on or even just a strong eye bolt um, with a safety wire. And it's to stop anything actually going in there and, uh, you know, people getting overzealous with metal studs and putting them right through into the front of the panel. So um, that also keeps it clear of the wiring as well. So all in all, uh, I, I'm really impressed with the quality of this unit. It's not actually what I was expecting. I, I was expecting for a unit that costs about £80, I was expecting them to have cut corners and made it as cheaply as possible. But uh, looking at that, uh, just visually, the quality of the construction and the fact that it is proper uh, standard RS-485 receiver and transmitter chips makes me think this is actually a really professional um, unit. It's, it's very good. It seems to comply with the standard. Um, so, um, yes, this is a... I definitely like this. I think it's a very good inside. I'm kind of glad I bought it now. It's better than I was expecting. <laughs>